A very warm welcome to all of you fine and amazing listeners. This is the Nikhil Hogan Show, and I am so honored to be speaking with a great guest today, Professor Thomas Christensen. Professor Christensen is the Avalon Foundation Professor of Music and Humanities at the University of Chicago, and his most recent book is Tonality in the Age of Francois-Joseph Fettis, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2019. Professor Christensen, welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Nikhil. Now, can you tell me a little bit about your musical background and what led you to eventually focusing on the history of music theory? Well, I think I'd have to say it was the um, influence of two uh, of my professors at um, when I studied at Yale University back in the uh, uh, early 1980s. So that was quite a while ago. But um, I was fortunate to work with both David Lewin and Claude Poliska, who are well known among um, musicologists and music theorists for uh, for their work and um, both of them um, did work uh, in the history of music theory and I was lucky to take a number of seminars with both of them and it um, it ignited my uh, my interest I think in the topic I should say it first exposed the topic to me which I didn't know had really existed and then um, as I the more I uh, worked in it the more uh, engaged I became. Right. And uh, can you tell me what was the state of research in this area at the time when you started beginning doing your research? Well, music theory, as I'm sure you know, and the listen, your listeners know, is, um, is you know, a relatively new entry into the uh, discipline of academic musicology. Um, really, I'd say only uh, has it um, gotten a foothold within about the last 50 or so year, years, and, uh, and Yale was one place where um, it got its first toehold, I would say. Um, and uh, so when I went into uh, the study of music theory, I was not, as I said, I had no idea that there was such a thing as history of theory. I just thought I was going to study theory and analysis. And at the time, um, we used to joke the uh, the reigning paradigm was uh, sets and shanker, which is to say pitch class set theory um, and uh, the analytic theory of Heinrich Schenker, both of which seemed quite avant-garde at the time when I uh, went into graduate school. Let's begin perhaps with thorough base. How did you come to study thorough bass? I have a feeling that um, a sensibility that thorough bass was not really so much of interest to people, I guess, in the 20th century. Why did you choose that as something that you wanted to focus on? Well, I would say that was not the first um topic I, I began focusing on when I was in, in, in graduate school, although I was always, I was a keyboardist and actually um, had a harpsichord um, that I built myself out of what? Uh, w- one of those, fam- those famous Zuckerman kits. Wow. Over here in North America, there was a company that made kits you could buy. I'm not even sure if they still do that these days, but um, you would, um, I bought a little virginal kit and I remember building it in my dorm room um, <laughs> as a, uh, as a college student. And I think, um, I think that was my sort of initial, it was a sort of a practical entree into figured bass that I, I uh, first um, sort of was, was uh, exposed to it. I didn't really ever think of it in any kind of academic sense. It was just a practical thing for playing Baroque music, which I always loved to do. And, uh, and that's, that was how I began, I think, to um, get involved with that. And um, I should say I was sort of kind of goofing around with Partimenti before I even know that that existed. I, I used to just sort of love improvising and playing in kind of a pseudo-Baroque style on the keyboard, and I guess I still do. Can I ask, what was the perception of figured bass or thorough bass in, in, I guess, the 80s or the 70s or the 90s? My sense was that it was you know, very much kind of a practical skill that was that was good to know. I mean, I remember even in um, even in uh, graduate school, you know, taking some courses and or at least some tutorials on um, 
realizing figured bases. Um, but I think it was considered, yeah, somewhat of kind of a, a, a practical skill that theorists sh should should have. Um, I think it was much later that there was a more historical um, perspective on thorough base, which um, I would say, you know, partly stemmed from the um, historical performance movement that um, began to sort of reanimate a lot of different traditions of thorough base, um, recognizing that it wasn't kind of a, a single uniform style or skill, but that there were many uh, schools of thorough base and historical moments. And um, Ah, that's a great, that's a great jumping point. Okay, so when people say figured base in the, I guess in, in nowadays, I mean, there's that it means different things to different people, as you just said. And uh, many people, some people think of figured base as the numbers you see according to the Roman numerals. Sometimes Roman numerals have figured base, but there's so many ways to look at it. Now, how, how can somebody who is not familiar with figured base make sense of the different schools? What are the main schools to thorough base or figured base? Oh boy. Well, now you're I'm getting into an area that I I really can't cl claim huge expertise in uh since I'm not a professional harpsichordist or keyboardist um playing early music, but um I certainly became aware in the course of my research that there were um you know, some uh some some major differences between um you know Italian schools of of, of uh, figured base versus German schools and uh French schools. I mean these are the music of you know these countries and uh lands in the eighteenth century, needless to say, were uh were were could be quite contrasting. And uh, so it makes sense that the uh continual practice also would have been um had individual characteristics to it. Could we mention some some general differences between perhaps the Germans or the Italians and the French? Is there things that stand out as key differences? Oh boy! I mean, even there, I think you 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 need to distinguish between um, you know different. Um, geographical areas and genres too that you would be playing with um you know playing a harpsichord in a large um orchestral um you know genre would be different than you'd play in a very small you know chamber performance um and uh you know it partly depends on the on the uh the style and the piece i mean there could be you know it can go from extremely simple um unornamented basic chordal realization to you know full blown um improvisatory embellishments and elaborations and which you could find in uh some north german styles of a uh, keyboard um of a uh, thorough bass um Many of the French uh, schools tended to be, I think, a little bit, little bit more simpler and less adorned in uh, ensemble playing than uh, elsewhere. And then, of course, there's the Neapolitan school, the uh, Partimenti tradition, which emphasizes solo realization, and that's uh, is itself is going to be a very different style of texture and realization than if you were on in an ensemble. So. I mean, what you just have to remember about figured bass is it's just a basic notation um, of harmonies and chords, and um, so it really just depends on what the uh, what the school and tradition, genre, style, period, all of that that you uh, you're plugging it into at at any given time. It's clear that um, in in I've read from your uh, research that people like uh, Friedrich Neat and Bach had uh, tremendous things to say about thorough bass. Uh, they would say it's the foundation of everything. For some, it's accompaniment. For some, it's uh, an entire giant system of learning how to eventually compose. Um, mm -hmm. So let, let's take Bach, for instance. And he took that quote from Neat. For him, thorough bass was more than just accompaniment, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there we're talking about a kind of pedagogical tradition um, that um, thorough bass was was understood very much as an entree into you know, learning uh, yeah, composition, and um, and that was that was not 
universally shared sentiment, but um, in box uh, circle, uh, it it what it was considered to be, yeah, you know, very much, uh, very much so. And I, I should say, not just box circle, but um, you know, a, a great number of uh, of uh, musicians at the time and pedagogues, you know, saw the uh, thorough basis fundamental to uh, musical training, musical knowledge. If I could jump backwards in time, just to when Thorough Bass or Basso Continuo first appeared at the turn of the 17th century, I was interested to note that there was some criticism of Thorough Bass when it first appeared by people who thought it was, what What are these people doing? They're just hack uh, companies. Or, was that criticism justified? Obviously, Figured Bass became explosively popular subsequently. Well, there was... Um there was a number of, um, of of criticisms about the practice. Um, oftentimes, it was um, maybe the people who were the the criticisms aimed more at the the, the actual keyboardists um, doing this. And I should say it's not just keyboardists. Um, there would also be those who would strum lutes and guitars and teorbos too, and they they were part of the continuo tradition. Um, but I think there was there was certainly criticism that. Basically, a lot of uh, the uh, the musicians who were playing it just didn't know what they were doing and couldn't do it very well. Um, but as a pra- – and that was the criticism. I think you may be thinking of Johann Matheson, who I talked about in one of my um, – at various places in some of my writings, who um, was a very fierce critic of um, thorough bass. Not so much that he um, – said it shouldn't be in music. I mean, he recognized, of course, that it was a part of, you know, performance and um, musicians, uh, there, there needed to be people who could play it. I don't, you know, at, by the ni- 18th century, I don't think there was anyone who gainsayed, you know, that, you know, the continuo was part of practice and it was it was a useful one. But what Matheson and um, some of his 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 uh, school um, or followers would argue is that it just was not fundamental to composition, you know? and he was a uh, he was very much um, of an aesthetic uh, view. You know what he thought was the more progressive view that the important thing in music was melody and um, you know a, a very singing style of of, of writing and playing, and that. Um, you know, continuo was just simply this sort of a kind of hack work of just playing chords, and that's all it was. But you'll never be a good musician if you don't know how to write a beautiful melody. And figured bass has nothing to say about. So, that. is he right that figured bass and thorough bass has nothing to say about melody? Or have people rebutted that, or is that a, a, a fair criticism of thorough bass? Uh, gosh. Um... I've never sort of thought about joining in that polemic to take sides on that. Yeah, well, pretty much anything um, Matheson says, I think, can often be read as a, as a little bit of hyperbola and um, polemic. Um, that was kind of his personality. So I, I think he's being, um, I think he's definitely being a little unfair about about that. Um, at the t- same time, though, you and, and I should also say he's he's not being very um, he, he's not being very um, consistent either because uh, he he was actually someone who wrote a huge amount on thorough bass pedagogy, several treatises, and even a uh, introducing into North Germany um, some partimento exercises and practices. So um, I think he was being a little disingenuous when he said that. A great figure that you've covered is Jean-Philippe Rameau, and you've done some stellar work researching him, and he is a very influential figure in music theory, music history. Let's talk about him, and I guess the general almost cartoon image of him is he's the fundamental bass guy, and so everything he thinks about, so if we think of music, there's a fundamental chord behind everything, Um, but he is much more complex than that. He's also very practical. How should we approach Rameau, and how should we consider him with a little bit more nuance? I think the reason I got interested in Rameau when I was in graduate school, I mean, this became basically the focus of my dissertation and my first book book and work in in, uh, historical music theory was um, because he seemed like such a cartoon character that I was reading uh, in in what I was reading. And and much of that reading came from some of the Schenkerian literature that I was reading where Schenker famously put – 
opposed Rameau to Beethoven and said, you know, we have a crisis in our music, you know, culture at this time. And is it going to be Beethoven or is it going to be Rameau? And I thought that was a was that had to be a specious opposition between the two of them. And as I dug a little bit into that. Um, I think that's one way I started getting interested in historical theory because I began to realize, well, Rameau was a much more complex and interesting and sophisticated writer than this caricature suggests. It wasn't just you know, stacking thirds up and getting chords and assigning them a root, and that was about it. Um, at the same time, I also wondered why would Schenker say something like that, and that made me curious to know more about um, where some of his – his very strong nationalist rhetoric and ideologies came from too. So in from sort of both sides, I began to kind of want to sort of peek behind the curtain and see what was going on with, with, with these kinds of arguments. He is an 18th century figure in music. And so would he have shared in the thorough base uh, thought process of music, a practica and practical thinking. And when he is composing music, because he was really uh, admired as a composer, did he compose thinking with his theories in the sense that of this cartoon image we have, and, ah, I'm going from this chord to this chord, and the bass line is, is subservient to the actual fundamental chord here? Or are these two separate things? Is this a scientific side to his thought, and then he had a separate practical side? Um, well, that's a uh, that's a really important question, and that's one that I've I, I have had to explore quite a bit in my um, in some of my work. Um, I think I've always I've ended up always seeing it as a kind of dialectic that they both, you know, they're both sides of his both his personality as well as as his intellectual thought. Um, no, I don't think he you know simply thought okay I'm going to put down you know. He, he thought about his his theory as as a as a, a means and method of composition, um, even though he actually at certain points suggested it could be. But um, I think his his mind was trained. Um, you know, he, he he understood music kind of instinctively, and uh, what what the, what his theory supposedly elucidates is a kind of maybe subconscious. Um, operation of the musician's mind that is to say you know the reality of co chords and harmonies that have roots and that the roots connect um you know by you know intelligible rules uh, to one another and um but that this is not something one sort of consciously says okay my next chord has to connect by some kind of fifth chord, um, you know, by by a, a a perfect fifth or a fourth, um, in order to follow this theory, something like that. That would that would have been you know much too mechanical, and he um, he he certainly would not have ever ever accepted that. There's a point to thorough base where okay, if you're not going to think of fundamental chords, then you have to learn maybe hundreds of different chords over a particular bass. And the thinking is, oh, if I have a fundamental chord, it simplifies it down to, what was it, two chords that Rameau said there's only really two chords? And then maybe he had the subdominant chord later. Is that maybe yeah. aimed at, a, at a, an easier way to learn music rather than the, the hundreds of chords that thorough bass might yield to a beginning student? Right. That was, um, yeah, that was a kind of um, sort of a pedagogical uh, heuristic that, um, you know, could help a student maybe understand the morass of chords, the chord figures, um, that there, you know, there's ways of sort of reducing these to a couple of fundamental types. And that was, um, that was sort of the, um, the hook about um, chordal inversion and you know one reason it became very popular is that it 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 gave a sort of a very simple way of understanding and relating certain figures to one another so that you know the triad was you know um similar to a six three and a six four chord um you know if you just uh inverted them in in, in different ways um Right, and that certainly became a kind of a, a sort of a useful tool for you know basic um, performance or teaching and, and and learning to realize the uh, the the thorough base. But um, I think it's base that it's basically that it's a kind of a introductory 
way to understand how these chords relate and, and to learn the realization. But pretty quickly, um, any good keyboardist um, doesn't spend that much of time thinking that every time you come to a 6-3 chord saying, ah, you know, this is a first inversion of this triad here. I think you know, you're just you, – you, you, you have other things to be thinking about and work and well, paying attention to. Well, one thing I've noticed to. is if you do think of that fundamental chord where you do have to add an extra layer of, of thought – that slows you down a little bit. Uh, whereas if you if you thought just strictly mm-hmm. from the base, it you it is faster because you remove one extra thought process. Yeah, exactly. And so I think um, you do have to disentangle the 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 practical side of his theory, if you will, from the more the more deep deeper intellectual substrata, which um, was extremely important to him, and uh, but it was not necessarily something you had to, um, if you will, bring to the fore of your consciousness if you're playing music or even writing music for that matter. And it's not without reason one of his last writings uh, that he uh, that he published in his lifetime was an essay that was called. Um, uh, our instinct for music, that's sort of the basic English translation of it. And uh, it was very much um, about the ways that um, you know, musicians um, might operate sort of with this kind of subconscious instinct about the fundamental base. Um, but it's not something that, you know, it, it, it's one that you're always aware of at the time. Now, could you speak on his practicality as a pedagogue? Because I, I, I feel a lot of people think of him as a theorist, but he is quite a significant practical musician. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's one of a, a point I kind of try to hammer home in, uh, yeah. <laughs> in, in my book about him is that he's very much sort of a, you know, has a, uh, is, is, is both a theorist and a practicing musician. And all you have to do is look at his very first big treatise, the, uh, on harmony, the Traité de l'Harmonie. And, um, the first two books are, if you will, speculative, theoretical on chords and the fundamental base. And then the last two books are practical ones on thorough base and then on composition. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's modeled on that that distinction of practica and teorica that you know goes back to uh, Zarlino and uh, even earlier to uh, you know, Gaforio and Ramos and uh, into the Middle Ages. A constant conversation I've noticed is this question of chord invertibility, and again, that it's it's a term that that could mean different things to different people. Why was CPE Bach hostile to Rameau and Kernberger as well? Even though Kernberger seemed to have adopted some of Rameau's uh, thinking. Well, those are yeah, those are interesting questions too that I've uh, that I've uh, I was always fascinated by as as well um, because you're right that uh, someone like Kernberger turns out to have been offered i think one of the most uh one of the most elaborate and um and in some ways uh pedagogically effective uh ways of learning Rameau's theory of the fundamental base even though he never once mentioned his name to him and um i think the answer to your question goes back to um where we began that um, is it's the politics of, uh, of music theory. Um, it's uh, it, it never has been and still is not just a dispassionate intellectual exercise. There can be different opinions and polemics and arguments. And sometimes they don't always have, um, have anything to do or not completely um, on just very, um, you know, scientific questions of testing and verifying some statement or uh, or a rule that um, a theorist deduces. Um, they can often be based on petty jealousies and um, and rivalries, and um, and that's the case I think with uh, in uh, with. Uh, Rameau's reception in Germany that there was uh, you have to put it in the context of um, of kind of polemics between French music and um, and 
its recept and the way that it was um, received in Germany at the time, um, and um, that, that's likewise, I think, part of the ways that Schenker was looking at it too was a, it was sort of this innate prejudice against um, almost anything French, um, and that would have included something like Rameau too. This question of court invertibility, did it originate with Rameau or can we see it in the history of music theory go even earlier than him? And, and where do, you, do we see the earliest conceptions of chordal invertibility? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, a number of scholars have looked into this question, and um, it, um, it it seems like it's been almost a little competition. Who can find the earliest citations of some of these of, of uh, you know triadic invertibility? Just as there's a little other uh, Olympic uh, contest for where is the first <laughs> chord root that's been identified, or where is there the first Ro- who used Roman numerals for yes. the very first time, and so forth. Um, all of these have deep roots in the 17th century um, and you know possibly even earlier um, it, it, it depending on how you read the evidence but I mean chord inversion certainly comes goes back to the early 17th century where um, theoretically you had some um, writers in in, in Germany um, who were analyzing the the triad um, where you know parts of this came up um, as 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 a discussion, um, and uh, you also find it in some very practical ways of some of the uh, uh, continuo um, pedagogies at the time, where um, as you mentioned earlier, there um, the the keyboardist. The, the, these these uh, figures were often taught as very simple, you know, kind of transpositions of one another, six three six four from the five three. But there was no theoretical um, argument about that. It was just simply, hey, if you want a really simple way of um, playing, um, you know, understanding the six three chord, just imagine the third below it and think of the triad on that, and that's what you play with your right hand. And you know, it's as simple as that. And that you find in you find throughout the 17th century. CBE Bach mentioned that there was a lot of new harmonies cropping up at the time of his writing, and is it just a consequence of the age that perhaps fundamental chord theory is useful to? Because already we have so many different chords, uh, now we have even more interesting harmonies cropping up. Perhaps we need to have a system to categorize all these harmonies and thus fundamental bass theory is more useful to categorize all these new chords and new harmonies. Yeah, I don't, I mean, fundamental bass is not, um, you know, or maybe more accurately, the, you know, Rameau's theory of chord generation is is not very uh, successful in accounting for a lot of the um, you know the more dissonant harmonies that were being uh, tested by composers in the uh, in especially later in the 18th century. But even for that matter, for uh, you know some of the figures that J. S. Bach would have uh, used in um, in some of his writings, um, you know that's always been one of the um, one of the the I guess the difficulties of of, of using very strict you know uh, Rameauian you know chord theory or or for that matter Roman numeral theory is that it's just um, it's it it can't accommodate um, in any strictly generative way these harmonies you have to take an account counterpoint and you know and most of those would end up being very difficult and complex harmonies you know usually um, are better understood as um, you know various counterpuntal voices that are moving above the harmony and you know maybe at a given verticality be caught in a harmony but um, you know can't really be understood as sort of organically resulting from some kind of generative source um, it's 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 the play of counterpoint and that's where you know figured bass is a much more 
uh, if you will, you know, accurate notation for uh, for for capturing this than is uh, than is uh, than than our Roman numerals. Did Rameau speak of counterpoint in his theoretical treatises? Of course, he did. I don't can I cannot imagine any, uh, you know, any. Uh, well, that's not true. I was going to say I can't imagine any theorist who deals with harmony who can't who doesn't also mention counterpoint. But uh, yeah, I suppose I suppose there are those. There are s- some exceptions to that. But um, in any case, yes, Ramo, um, you know, had sections on counterpoint in some of his in in, in many of his writings. Um, you know, admittedly, he didn't develop it the way you know, in, in the way that you know, maybe those who were exploring you know, species counterpoint through through you know, the writings of Fuchs or such um, might have approached counterpoint. But um, you know, even for something um, as simple as a um, his uh, his so-called chords of supposition, which were the ways he tried to, at one point, account for uh, suspension chords like four three. He um, he at um, at different points in his his career and writings would say, well, you can also just think of this as a delay of the uh, of the third. The a, a note is being suspended over into the next chord, and and that. Um, is uh, not part of the original core of, of the uh, fundamental base. It's just a uh, it's a delay um, of, a, of of a resolution. And uh, likewise, he uh, at various points interpreted the six four chord, you know, alternatively as an inversion of a triad or as a suspension, um, especially in cadential points to a uh, a double suspension to a triad. So. Um, I think Rameau was was he was too good of a musician not to understand that you know counterpoint and voice leading played a role in 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 harmony. Let's turn to the rule of the octave, and I noticed that you write that that's something that he analyzed quite seriously. The rule of the octave and and trying to apply his theories and reconciling his mm-hmm. theories to the rule of the octave. Yeah, he did. The well, there was a um, I mean an obvious reason for that that was one of uh, the the fundamental exercises and models of uh, thorough bass pedagogy um, and you find it you know in in the partimenti school you know is one of the very first exercises um, every student needs to learn it's just a, what is the uh, normative harmonization of the uh, major and minor scales in the bass and um, and so being such a central part of thorough bass uh, training, um, I think Ramo felt it, if you will, almost an obligation to try to show, in fact, that it's, it's theoretical origin, if you will, it's uh, for understanding it and why it works as it does, um, th- th- that it's a, uh, there's a theoretical explanation that you can uh, – he could pose using his his own theory of the of the uh, bas fundamental, and um, but it didn't quite work out because there are ways that it didn't it doesn't doesn't fit precisely with some of his more orthodox um, prescriptions about the thorough base, and so it became a kind of an irritant in his writings, and it's something he returned to you know many many times and couldn't quite make it work um, but he became he was very creative in you know in in testing different solutions to that but is that connecting the sixth chord to the seventh chord the sixth scale degree to the seventh scale degree yeah ascending um, yeah that's one of the places where there, there would often be a um, uh, a, a, a disjunct um, because that would require um, would require a subdominant chord moving to a, a a dominant chord, and according to his um, his, his his original theory, uh, you shouldn't have uh, you shouldn't generally have a um, a motion by a second um, in the fundamental base. You know, it's better to interpret the um, the uh, the four the what we would call the subdominant in that case as a kind of inverted uh, supertonic chord, the chord on two, and so that became um, that became one of the knots, if you will, in his uh, 
that that he couldn't quite untangle in his uh, his arguments about the uh, the rule of the octave. Very interesting. Uh, could you just speak on his influence in Italy? And even in for the Neapolitans, by the turn of the 19th century, they had adopted fundamental base theory. Some of them did, not all of them. Um, but yes, it, it, uh, it's, uh, you know, and you could say that about um, you know, almost every, uh, every musical, uh, you know, uh, center in Europe by the beginning of the 19th century. I mean, some version of... Uh, of, of chordal theory, um, maybe not specifically the fundamental base, but certainly, you know, the, the, the derivatives of that, which is the uh, Roman numeral Stufen theory, um, certainly became widespread um, and almost ubiquitous, not, not completely. Um, there were still very resilient pockets of, um, I think, sort of the more Italian influenced partimenti schools that continued to be taught but um it was certainly um i think in a, in, a, in the more popular you know market of uh of uh harmony pedagogy and um composition manuals that were published um the uh the the the, the triadic approach the the roman numeral and fundamental base was was predominant is the appeal of, of Rameau's theories because it's more scientific and, and more uh, of a higher order of thought compared to something like counterpoint, which is not considered not as scientific around that time? Well, if you're talking about the, like, the turn into the 19th century, yes, um, yes. I would say that Rameau's fundamental base – really was receding. Um, there was a famous moment in uh, with the founding of the uh, Paris Conservatory and uh, at the very beginning of the 19th century where um, it was decided that they were no longer going to teach the fundamental base and instead adopted a, uh, um, a manual by another professor of composition there named Cattell, um, which had you know, no f- fundamental base in it whatsoever. Um, with the exception of um, a kind of idiosyncratic school in Vienna uh, with Simon Sector, there was really very few uh, theorists in the 19th century who taught anything that looked like the fundamental base. So that part of Rameau's um, theory, I think, sort of def- definitely receded into the background. Um, but what you had in its place, of course, was the uh, Roman numeral uh, Stufen theory of of, uh, of uh, writers such as uh, Weber in, in Germany um, and Jelpensberger in, in France, which were, um, if you will, the next generation of Rameau's uh, theory. But it was uh, one that did not um, emphasize so much the kind of chord by chord syntax that Rameau was focused on with his fundamental base, um, and it it um, it became dominant in Europe partly because it was just it was very simple. I mean, it became a um, a uh, it, it had a very it had a practical value for you know learning basic harmonies and. Um, and understanding, you know, how certain chords or chord patterns uh, functioned, and uh, it it um, it's one reason why, you know, to this day it is still a dominant, and I I'm still tempted to say the dominant way that tonal harmony is uh, taught and understood by most uh, most musicians. And that, that word tonal and tonality, it's a great segue to the next person, which is Francois-Joseph Fetis. And you wrote an amazing book that was published in 2019. Let's talk about him now. Why did you select him as a subject for study? Oh, gosh. Um, well, um, I, I mentioned in the preface to the book a little bit of the history of that. I mean, it was... It, it, I mean, on the one hand, I'd always been interested in Fetis's writings since I learned about them in um, in, in graduate school, and uh, and and found them really fascinating. Um, and partly because there's it's mixed in with so much philosophical uh, 
um, um, I, philosophical ideas that uh, Fetis brought into it, metaphysical notions that were, you know, very much associated with the kind, with certain currents of German idealist philosophy, especially Hegel. And I'm always attracted to um, thinking about music theory and you know in intellectual contexts. And then um, I um, I returned to Fetis many years later in my in my career, partly because I um, I was actually asked just to to do a paper um, at a conference at some point in 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 England on tonality, and um, so I returned to some of the very early work that I did in this and sort of went through some of my notes. And um, as I started writing this paper, um, I started exploring more of Fetis's own voluminous writings on both theory as well as history and eth what we would call ethnomusicology and um, and just became more and more fascinated by it. And so that little conference paper, little by little, uh, morphed into uh, what turned out to be a, uh, a large book on, on the topic. He was a, a teacher at the um, Paris Conservatory. That's um, right. And so did he teach according to Cattell's methods? Um, he would have probably had to do that at some point, although when he started teaching, that was about, what, around 1823. So that was over two decades after the Cattell treatise was introduced. Um, what, I, what we do know that he taught, though, was Partimenti. Um, his very first publication was essentially a Partimenti harmony text. Um, and uh, it was uh, one that was quite current um, and and popular in uh, in the Paris Conservatory at that time too. Um, you know, we tend to you have to uh, remember places like the Paris Conservatory did not have always a single um, pedagogy or method, even though they would oftentimes, you know have certain official proclamations um, endorsing a certain text. Um, it was filled with uh, very contentious and combative personalities there teaching um, in rivalry. And so you had someone like um, Anton Reicher, who had his own very idiosyncratic way of teaching harmony and composition, along with uh, the Carabini from Italy, who had you know his perspective, and then uh, and then you have Fetis, who was you know was famously combative as a personality and pugnacious and opinionated, and so it was really a, it was a hot house of uh, very <laughs> competing hotheads. Um, this uh, perhaps is a microcosm of that could describe this is uh, Fetis's interactions and relationship with Berlioz. And they really went at it, <laughs> it seems like it from the way I'm reading. And so what was the issue there? Did he feel like Berlioz was not good at writing melodies and his notion of harmony was incorrect or something? Um, well, I think it, it, it really began with with. Berlioz just thinking that Fetis was a complete charlatan as a um, wow. as as both a musician and as a uh, <laughs> wow. as a theorist um, and uh, Berlioz himself was not a uh, a blushing violet when it came to expressing his opinions either so you put the two of them in one room and it was kind of like you know um, fireworks it, yeah <laughs> yeah it, was, it, it really was bare knuckled combat but. Um, I mean, the initial, the initial, um, I, I think, spark for for their rivalry and 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 arguments was um, some editing that Fetis did of Beethoven's symphonies, where he thought, you know, Beethoven must have made some mistakes because, you know, that that he thought violated the laws of tonality and, um, you know, we should, you know, uh, and then then Fetis had the uh, sort of the had had the idea that he would uh, rewrite some of these passages and um that just made Berlioz apoplectic uh, when he when he saw these and um and I think from then on um everything went downhill yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we don't need to take sides here but maybe what was uh, Fetis's point of view did Fetis have 
validity in his commentary of Beethoven's harmony? And or was Berlioz did Berlioz also have a point that you shouldn't have edited Beethoven's notes? Well, I mean, it, it's very easy to look back at that and, and laugh at Fétis and say, oh, what a you know, stupid theorist. And this is what, you know, what, you know, how typical of academics that they would, you know, do something like this. Um, you know, remembering this was this was before the notion of sort of, you know, the Urtext and Werktreue and all of these sort of, you know, ideals about, you know, the, the, the masterwork were, you know, widely accepted. Um, it wasn't that unusual for editors and performers to, you know, make, amend, make alterations in the music that they played. Um, wow, okay. You know, oftentimes on the spur or just say, you know, well, I think we're going to do it this way. I mean, there were, um, there, there was, you know, a, a a fair amount of license that was sometimes, um, you know, that's really that interesting. Musicians wow. would take and and, but with that said, um, it, um, you know, I think I understand why Fetis did what he did. I I would not, I would not endorse that we do this today in any performance. That's for sure. But it, um, you know, if you followed sort of the the. The spirit of what his his notions of tonality were, and um, it was one that um, you know you could say yes, these 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 chords or these uh, these uh, these moments in, in 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 Beethoven, you know, do not reflect orthodox tonality um, in in that particular sense. Um, I think he was, you know. An obvious limited hearing on Fetis's part, but it, um, you know, there there was a reason he thought that. Um, you know, he said the same thing about uh, the uh, dissonant quartet of uh, of Mozart, um, the uh, famous opening that uh, became a polemic too, was one that um, Fetis actually had started when he tried to rewrite the opening of the uh, dissonant quartet to basically get rid of those dissonances that made it so <laughs> right. so effective to begin with. Um, yeah. Uh, well, Riemann said, we are indebted to Fétis for the modern concept of tonality, and uh, many other theorists in the future, Hindemith, Liszt, were influenced by his writing. So for people who are not familiar with Fétis, what are the salient, prominent aspects of him on the subject of tonality that perhaps stands out in his work? Well, um... I have my own views on that. I'm not sure it's I, I, they were necessarily the ones that Riemann or Hindemith would have um, would have agreed with. Um, it you know I I I think that the what I find the interesting elements about Fetis's theory of tonality is that he he was the first one I think to in a rigorous way um, to think about tonality from a historical point of view, not as an immutable system of laws, scientific, that sort of was, you know, was, uh, could be, you know, almost demonstrated as a kind of geometrical system um, uh, through, through, you know, deductive reasoning. It, um, it was one that was very much rooted in different cultures and thus there were different tonalities over historical periods and across cultures, um, I think he 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 terribly misanalyzed some of those tonalities. Um, so it's not an endorsement of his scholarship per se, but the idea though that musical languages can evolve, can change, and um, are not necessarily rooted in you know acoustical or mathematical arguments. Um, you know, was a very powerful and original um, contribution on his part, um, and so I, 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 I certainly give Fetis credit uh, credit for that. Even though, at the same time, he also brought in some you know very noxious uh, notions of sort of cultural superiority of of the Europeans and um, you know extremely distaste, disdainful of sort of non-Western musical uh, systems or um, so much earlier music too, all of which he, you know, did not fit into his notion of, you know, of, of progressive 
teleology and in musical uh, evolution. I'm going to jump around a little bit, if you don't mind. I have so many questions here. Let me ask you something about Thorobase again. I, let me just go back. Now, there's there's recently there's been criticism of Roman numerals among people because they, they say that thinking in terms of Roman numerals causes one to think of music too much in a vertical mindset. Uh, but isn't Thorobase also kind of a vertical-oriented practice? Because you do have to think of the vertical sonority or chord quality first before elaborating horizontally. So could you speak on that? Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine anyone who plays continuo or um, teaches it and um, you know, puts it into practice um, not thinking about it in both dimensions. It's like it's like saying music works in a single dimension, which is obviously untrue. And um, so you, I think you have to have a um, – you know, a sensitivity, sensibility for the, the you know, the individual harmonies that may be articulated as you're playing, but also how they are connected and how they are elaborated, which is, of course, voice leading. Um, and so the, uh, um, it, it, it seems like it's just, it's, it's, it's the balance between those two that is, that's, uh, that, that the continual playing, you know, it, you know, has to elucidate just as compositionally. I mean, it's you can't imagine saying to a composer, you know, well, you're going to write just just chords, um, or you're just going to write counterpoint. Um, you know, assuming we are talking about a kind of you know basic um, sort of common practice tonality of the uh, 18th or 19th centuries. Um, those are uh, you. You really have to take both of those into account, and any good pedagogy would do that. Just as I think any good um, continual player uh, would 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 take would be thinking about those. Now, Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov and Arnold Schoenberg both famously put down figured bass in their respective harmony texts. Are they correct when they say that the training of this sort is no longer needed? Well. Um, that could that that I have to say I don't know that, um, but th there certainly were um, a number of pedagogues at the uh, in the nineteenth century who um, did push back against thorough base, um, especially in sort of the harmony textbooks, and it was partly for those reasons we uh, we were talking a little bit about earlier that it's just um, it 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 was. It was associated more, I would say, with a practice, a style of music that obviously was not being practiced at the time. Baroque, um, you know, 17th and early 18th century um, uh, performance practices um, and that the kinds of – not only the kinds of harmonies that were being written in the 19th century but also uh, just musical forms and styles were um, – you know, I th there was a thought that this this you know should not simply be thought of as sort of a kind of chord by chord, you know, chunking of harmonies that you know can be encoded in figures and 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 taught that way. Um, so it was really, I think, very much a sort of a, a sense of both for style and pedagogy that it was uh, it, it was a less efficient way and um, it was just uh, a somewhat outmoded language in which to uh, in instruct um, harmonies and the um, the rise of functional theory in Germany in the uh, in the 19th century you know was really quite antithetical to the uh, the thorough base um, perspective where um, where, where harm it was less a matter of sort of you know a minute taxonomy of harmonies that could be encoded in you know Roman numerals and figures as much as understanding certain kinds of dynamic gestures and motions um, that uh, that that seemed you know more conducive to a kind of functional interpretation and I, I suspect that was part of the um, that was also part of the uh, the, the rejection of the uh, of the thorough base. If we contrast that with perhaps Nadia Boulanger, who sort of taught kind of partimenti with these figured bases, is it fair to say that she was able to te bring out a more new tonal language with figured base and thorough base? Um, well, that's what I understand from people I know who who um, studied with her. Um, 
I was lucky to have a, a colleague at Chicago um, uh, where I teach who uh, named Easley Blackwood, who um, for many years studied in uh, Fontainebleau in Paris with her and uh, would describe some of her teaching. And, um, you know, I'd say emphatically that was that that was true. I mean, Nadia Boulanger is a. Uh, as uh, Robert Gerdingen has reminded us in several places, uh, is one of the uh, was one of the pedagogues in the 20th century who kind of kept the flame of Partimenti teaching, you know, alive throughout the uh, throughout the century. Um, and there were, you know, a number of others, but it was a uh, uh, it tended to be a rather small um, uh, community, if you will, of, of of acolytes, almost kind of a uh, you know, almost sort of a uh, kind of a, a a sect, if you will, of of, of uh, devotees to it. Um, and um, but yeah, it never completely went out, um, especially in the Paris Conservatory. That was one of the places where you know there was almost an unbroken tradition of teaching that. Um, Again, not exclusively, um, but it, 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 there were always – it seemed to be you know, some teachers there who, who were um, you know, very conscious of sort of maintaining this tradition um, of, of, of instruction. Now, I, I, uh, I'm really impressed by your scholarship, and I think people really should appreciate the pioneering work that you did. I just have this image of you sitting, pouring through pages of – of archival material, uh, thorough-based treatises and, and manuscripts. And, and this is not a theoretical question, but just a, a scholarship question is, what was that like, basically? Just did you find that you were alone in, when you're doing these sorts of things and being one of the few people revisiting these manuscripts? And uh, did you get a sense that your work would have such significant influence and importance uh, in, for future uh, enthusiasts of figured base and partimento and that sort of thing? Uh, well, that's th- I, I think you're being too kind in describing my work, but um, but I'll I'll take the compliment anyway. Um, I mean, I I never go into you know do any work or writing thinking that you know what is it effect going to be or is this going to be a game changer or anything like that. I think that would be a little hubristic of any scholar to have that as a motive to what they're doing. Um, I just always be just became fascinated, I think, by the historical. Um, roots of this um, this really odd discipline we call music theory. Um, you know, I think if you just, I always found it when, I, if I was just doing analysis or theory in, you know, sort of a contemporary way, um, my, whether it was Schenker or whether it was, you know, Roman numerals or whether it was 12-tone serial theory, whatever it was, you know, my mind would always go back, you know, where did this come from? You know, why are we doing this? Um, you know, this just didn't fall from heaven, you know, on the earth ready made. This was constructed by, you know, someone or some people. And, um, you know, how did this come about? So I I just found myself, um, and I still do, always just very curious to understand the genealogies of some of these ideas, some of these methods, some of these claims that um, theorists um, often make or accept and adopt. Um, and, you know, oftentimes without, you know, knowing you know where they came from and how they came about. And um, every time, just about every time I would look into something like that, I'd find it to be a fascinating story, usually much more complex and messy than we may often think. Um, but it, um, it ultimately shows that, I mean, theory like is – like any wonderful artistic and creative enterprise of humankind, it's a, it's a, it is a kind of creative gesture and a product of uh, of uh, of people thinking about it and and um, you know almost in a almost in a uh, in a kind of a, a, a sense of a, a creative way of uh, you know producing something just wonderful and suggestive and uh, that that has a uh, has a 
possibility of also, I think, intriguing following generations and thinking about this is a fascinating way to think about music, to hear it, to, you know, to conceptualize, you know, why it works as it does. And um, and that ultimately is why I think, uh, you know, for those few of us who pick this strange discipline of music theory to engage in what it why it continues to be so uh, attractive and engaging for us when i was in college we learned about roman numerals and i guess you could say stufen theory function theory and that was very much dominant in how we learned i have a question can we apply thorough to music like jazz and pop and without any issue as well well i mean i've seen some i've seen some Scholars who've attempted to do that um, and you know applied um, you know figures and um, you know more complicated um, yeah notions of, of of tonal theory to uh, to jazz um, you know I've seen you know very admirable attempts to apply Schenkerian theory to reading um, to reading uh, jazz and thinking of a, a wonderful book by uh, my uh, recent my my dear old friend uh, Stephen Larson who passed away a number of years ago um, but that's a difference there's a difference between that type of I think analytic application and thinking about it then as you know practical pedagogy for jazz and popular musicians and there I'd be hard pressed to see um, how many um, popular musicians would you know have the um, and I don't say this in any in, in any condescending way but basically have the background or interest in trying to sort of learn you know the the quite um, complex and sophisticated notation and theoretical um, ideas behind the, uh, the 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 thorough bass and room and 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 such um, for their own uh, for for the kinds of music that they're making um, I mean I think you know Roman numerals and basic chord symbols you know have pretty much been able to um, you know been sort of sort of the the useful entry of most of these musicians into, you know, thinking but that, about... that, you know, honestly, Professor, that makes my head spin when I have to think of chords all the time, <laughs> when yeah. I have to think of, of, of inversions all the time. I, to me, personally, it's a lot easier if I just if you just tell me the intervals. Uh, but if you tell me, oh, this is a sus uh, nine, this, that chord with it over this, it, it makes my head spin. Well, if you think about it, I mean, some of the... Uh, the tablature notation that you know guitarists use um that's exactly what it does it doesn't tell you what you know theoretically what the chord is it just says put your first you know your second finger on this string here yeah. and your third <laughs> finger yeah. here and your fourth finger there and now strum it and um you know there's your chord and it if you know if anything i guess that's sort of telling you certain interval distances between it but it's telling you nothing about what the chord is and uh, a friend of mine he put uh, two ways of two scores well so one was with the chord symbols the letters on the top and it was all sorts of D sus over G and all sorts right. of stuff. And then the next score was numbers, figures. And well, maybe because I had a little bit of background in Partimento, it was a little bit easier for me, well, a lot easier to read the figures than it was to read the chord symbols. And the funny thing was, there was only three chords, but it was so many inversions. It was kind of crazy to put, make my head reconcile with all of those letters. Well, in many ways, you know, jazz pedagogy is you know i i tend to think is 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 almost um is sort of the our contemporary equivalent to uh, partimenti in that it's um it's really very much a practical less than a theoretical tradition of um one that is really often communicated orally and you know in a kind of apprenticeship I mean a jazz musician basically learns by playing sitting down at the keyboard if you're talking about, anyway about the the, the uh, pianist but I think it applies also for the uh, instrumentalists and singers too um, and basically just listening to what others are doing imitating it and then you know finding your own style and um, when I was pl when I was learned playing in jazz it was um you play jazz that's cool i did i don't 
claim great expertise in it, but I've always loved jazz and oh, and, great. and and played it. And it's um, those those symbols, you know, a, a sus chord and such. Those are ones that you know. After a while, it's just you know exactly what that means, and you know, sort of what what you're going to be playing there. And um, so, um, you know, for a jazz musician, especially if you're you know having to play from fake books and things like that, which is what I often did playing in lounges and hotel lobbies. You would just, uh, you know, those became as familiar to me as, as thorough bass symbols and uh, just as suggestive, um, even if they weren't quite as uh, articulate as the, uh, as the thorough bass. But then again, you know, a jazz musician was never under any, uh, any, uh, uh, requirement to have to play the same chord the same way each time, you know. So that's you would learn what you could vary, substitute, and, and so forth. And those, so those symbols were oftentimes just you know little triggers that you could use to think of what other alternatives there were. So final question: What is the best way to learn thorough bass? Oh my God, um, the best p- way to learn thorough bass. Well, I'm not sure I have a universal answer for that because I think it depends, you know, where someone is, what they want to learn it for, and what resources they may have. Um, you know, for myself, it was partly just sitting down and just playing a lot of uh, a lot of 18th century music, um, and uh, and beginning with some realizations that were already made and to get the sound into my ears and, and fingers. And then, uh, and then from there trying to sort of untether myself from written out realizations to where I could start, um, playing, you know, above a, a baseline, um, without having to have written out realizations, just following the, uh, the chord symbols and, you know, like like those jazz symbols. After a while, you begin to recognize some of them as old friends, and you sort of know uh, what you're going to do. But um, ultimately, there's not um, much of a substitute for uh, practicing, just playing and trying, and and uh, and uh, continuing to do it. Are there any uh, treatises that we should look to? And you've looked at uh, many uh, throughout the history of music theory. Do you recommend any particular author? You know, I don't think I have a, a specific one that I would that that I would assign. I've often used um, for students who wanted to have a little sort of historical perspective to it. I've often recommended the um, the treatise of a uh, of, of a uh, a Swiss writer um, eponymously named Jesper Christensen. We're no relation, and uh, <laughs> but he uh, but he has a wonderful um, manual of of thorough bass that um, that is very sensitive to sort of historical and nationalist styles of of realization, different notations, and um, uh, with with uh, with uh, exercises. More recently. Um, the Basel Conservatory has come out with a uh, a wonderful manual um, on improvisation. Uh, the I think it's called the Compendium Improvisation, and it um, is a number of um, wonderful contributions by uh, by scholars um, that uh, deal with um, obviously with improvisation, but using um, sort of gallant thorough base as a kind of pedagogical uh, launching point for this. And uh, the opening chapters of that, um, I think, would be a very good introduction to, you know, exercises and um, kind of sort of uh, models for um, both emulation and then points where you can then develop your own improvisational um, sort of facility. And that's, you know, ultimately for thorough bass, that's uh, that's what you have to be able to do. It's not just reading those figures, but knowing, you know, even then there's so much you need to, to add yourself, you know, how thick are you going to realize it? What is the voicing going to be? And how is that voicing going to connect with what follows? How much embellishment do I do? You know, do I add in figurations or ornamentations to it. Um, it really is a kind of improvisational practice. And um, 
So the more facility you can get, the more sense of freedom and uh, independence, um, I think the better you'll be as a uh, both as playing the thorough bass and frankly as a musician. Well, it's been a truly amazing conversation with one of the world's top music scholars, the great Professor Thomas Christensen. I can't stress how valuable and groundbreaking his research has been for music scholarship, and we owe a great deal to his work. His latest book is 2019's Tonality in the Age of Francois-Joseph Fétis, published by the University of Chicago Press, and it really reveals the depth of his amazing scholarship, a fantastic addition to anyone's library of music, so I really recommend everyone check it out. Professor Christensen, can you please tell my audience what's in store for you for 2021 and what future projects do you have planned? Well, right now I'm working with some um, scholars from um, on sort of an international project that um, we're launching on global music theory. And uh, we're at beginning stages of it, but it's um, there's been a great, I think, deal of fermentation of, of not only theoretical work around around the globe, but also an interest in differing traditions of mu- what of music theory and music pedagogy um, that um, are really uh, worth investigating, and uh, we're trying to bring this together in some. Um, in the foreseeable future with a uh, with some major uh, encyclopedic studies of uh, of world music theory but we're still in the early stages of it but I, I'm very excited about that at this moment well fantastic thank you so much Professor Christensen for being on the Nikhil Hogan show I hope you had a good time it was wonderful I appreciate it please come back soon bye bye now take care <laughs>